Uh, welcome uh, to the University of Worcester. Welcome to the inaugural lecture of Professor Pete Grobler. And um, uh, I just like to say I'm David Green. I'm the university's vice chancellor and chief executive. Uh, this is uh, both a, a sad and a happy occasion. Uh, it's a sad occasion because uh, Pete, who's much loved here at the university, uh, left us uh, in the summer to return to his native South Africa after a terrific uh, period of nearly nine years, I think it was, uh, working here at the university. And um, uh, Pete is just uh, one of the most popular and charismatic uh, lecturers, teachers, inspirers, and illustrators that you could possibly <laughs> hope to meet. Um, so uh, we were really sad when Pete uh, left the university while, of course, supporting him uh, personally uh, all the way. Um, now, Pete is one of the world's leading children's illustrators, and anybody who's had the privilege to uh, uh, read and to uh, look at the, any of the books that he's illustrated, and uh, David Broster, who's uh, head of the Institute of Arts here at the university, is going to read the citation. So I'm not going to steal lots of his thunder and tell you about all of Pete's many, many accomplishments. But believe you me, they are many. Um, but it's just a privilege to, uh, to read Pete's books. And he's got a wonderful way of connecting with children across uh, cultures, across continents. Um, so, uh, and he's certainly inspired many uh, uh, people uh, here at the university. Uh, many students who've gone on themselves to have terrific professional success uh, and, uh, and many colleagues. So we are delighted, it's a happy occasion, to welcome Pete back to the university for his inaugural lecture as a visiting professor. And all I can say is that we hope that this will be the first of many visits of Professor Grobler to the university where he will always be a much-loved colleague and friend. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's just have our first round of applause for Professor Pete Grobler. <laughs> and in just a second, I'm going to invite uh, David Broster to come and give the citation. Uh, David's worked with Pete for many years, and... Uh, himself has actually revolutionized drama for the better uh, here at the university together with uh, his great close colleague who very sadly died just the other day, Roy Pierce Jones, uh, who's much missed by us all and a number of other colleagues, some of whom are, are here. Um, and uh, David will give the citation, um, uh, then Pete will give us the lecture, which we're all looking forward to, and then Anne Hannaford, who uh, was for many years the director of... Um, uh, uh, information and learning here at the university um, uh, and uh, le led our library service and information service with great distinction and is now the director of arts and culture here at the university is going to give the vote of thanks and then we're all going to go upstairs uh, one way or another to the Cotswold suite and there will be our wonderful student ambassadors here to guide you along uh, together with Becky and Lucy and the colleagues who've organized this event uh, and you'll be able to have a glass of wine uh, or a soft drink uh, and toast um, Pete uh, having enjoyed his lecture. So uh, David, uh, you're on next. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, David. Let's just move the telephone out of the way. Okay, now normally, for an event such as this, I would stand here and I would tell you that tonight's speaker, Piet Grobler, is that right? Close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had lessons before, I had lessons. He's an internationally renowned illustrator with over 80 titles to his name. I would probably tell you that Piet has won prestigious awards all over the world. I would also tell you that Pete Grobler is one of the world's leading picture book illustrators, that his achievements include a Golden Apple Award at the Bernardi in, for illustration in Bratislava, and two silver medals in the Japanese Noma Concourse competition. I would also doubtless share my enthusiasm for the lecture that lies ahead. And indeed, 
I do. But this is no ordinary professorial lecture. This evening, we not only have the chance to hear a fascinating lecture from a leading figure in this field, but we also have the chance to welcome back an old friend. And I use old advisedly. <laughs> He's looking ridiculously well, don't you think? <laughs> Pete Grover first joined us here at the University of Worcester in 2009, when the illustration course was very much in its infancy. As the only lecturer on the course at the time, Pete immediately assumed the title of course leader, and that's exactly what he did. Over his eight-year tenure as course leader, illustration at the university grew from a fledgling course to a flourishing artistic community at the heart of a global network. With an open mind and appreciation for the values of diverse voices, Pete brought an outward-looking international perspective to the study of illustration here at Worcester a philosophy encapsulated in the launch of the International Centre for the Picture Booking Society in 2014. And Pete was instrumental in this process, leveraging his experience of illustration as a truly global art to help infuse the International Centre with the strong flavour of the many and varied voices uh, with which the illustration of our illustrative of art speak in a different cultures all over the world. Now, growing up on his family's cattle farm in South Africa, Pete spent much of his childhood absorbed in the natural world with all its glorious complexity. He observed and sketched animals that he found there and began to perceive not just their form, but also their characteristics and their behaviours. And indeed, I have it on great authority that one of Pete's great party tricks is to be able to match a person to the animal he feels they're most suited to <laughs> based on their personality, a potentially disconcerting ability. As well as being an amusing party game, this talent goes to the heart of Pete's art, helping him decide which human characteristics might best bring the animals and his illustrations to life. But despite his huge talent and natural affinity with his subject, for a young man growing up on a farm in South Africa, illustration was seen as something you did as a hobby, not as a job. So Pete chose to study for an honours degree in journalism, a certificate in graphic design, and a master's degree in theology before finally coming home to illustration with a master's in visual arts. Despite this seemingly circuitous route to a career as an illustrator, Pete's journey actually perfectly sums up many of the themes that characterise his work. A love of writing took him to journalism, a passion for working with people originally drew to theology, and a need to work more closely with images saw him seek out a career as a graphic designer. Pete's unique voice, both as an illustrator and as a scholar, is in many ways derived from the weaving of these diverse strands of experience into one richly textured artistic landscape. And although Pete's route to illustration is an indirect one, it has certainly worked to our advantage here at the University of Worcester. And the illustration course that Pete and his colleagues helped to build here has a strong focus on the real world experience, professional practice, and the building of effective networks, all traits that greatly benefit our students and help enrich the learning experience. Indeed, illustration students have landed professional animation contracts, had their illustrations included in prestigious international exhibitions, won book deals, and even seen their work featured in New York's Creative Quarterly. As Pete himself once said in an interview, and I'm not going to do the accent after trying to get your name, <laughs> I always tell our students that they need to get out there and meet people. Don't just be one of the pile of a hundred letters on a desk. Once you meet people, you become a personality with a face and a history. Publishers will remember you and think of you differently then. With the university's latest facility, the Art House, due to open its doors for the first time later this year, Illustration at Worcester will have a flagship facility that will help further much of the work that Pete himself initiated. Set in the very heart of our community, and with the facilities to accommodate public exhibitions and the space to host children's activities, the new art house will serve as a beacon for our inclusive approach, harnessing the power of art to bring people together and working to enrich the local community in which we make our home. And for Pete, illustration is a democratic art, an international art. Again, to borrow his own words, in illustration you're trying to communicate, to get a message across, it has a relationship with the text it addresses. It's like a tango. Each half of the partnership have different moves, but they have to work together to make one dance. And this is the relationship between image and text. 
This is illustration. A thoughtful, insightful scholar, a skilled practitioner, an internationally renowned artist, and a highly esteemed colleague, and a much-loved friend. It was a great loss to us here at the University of Worcester when Pete decided the time had come for him to return to South Africa last year. And that is why we're so delighted when Pete subsequently accepted our invitation to continue his association with the university as a visiting professor. And why, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me such tremendous pleasure to be able to welcome for his inaugural professorial lecture entitled Picturing Migration, Professor Pete Grovler. Professor Green, governors, fellows, university le leadership group, <coughs> colleagues, students and friends, thank you for having me. You must know that I have been living in an Afrikaans speaking city the last nine uh, months since I left here. So uh, my accent is likely to be even more boorish than it was <laughs> when I, you still knew me. And also my um, vocabulary likely to be more insufficient than it used to be. Um, tonight I would like to share with you what I do. I read and study picture books. I make picture books and I like to believe that I get involved with book, picture book projects that aim to promote or support the idea um, that might somehow serve society. Um, I believe pictures have power. They can enchant, they can persuade and inform, and also they can shock. The world had to see a photograph of a small migrant, a Syrian boy, with his face buried in the sand of a Turkish beach in September 2016. And it was not acceptable anymore for a prime minister to talk of swarms of immigrants, or for a vile journalist to compare them to cockroaches. That faceless boy gave identity to the migrant and the refugee. People like you and me who love and fear and make mistakes. And my theme tonight, it's, it's going to get lighter. <laughs> I promise you that. Um, I, th I would really like, I thought of this um, for these reasons, uh, that is what I do, and uh, it so happened that many interesting books on migration came my way, and also that we at the illustration department um, had a wonderful project, um, Migrations. I'll tell you all about that. To start with, I'm going to talk about some contemporary picture books, the ones that I've mentioned that work with migration as subject matter. <coughs> and um, I, will, I will read them uh, or discuss them. It's, it's, it's actually wrong to, to speak of finding its meaning because there are, there's no such thing as one meaning. We, we bring the meaning to the image and the book, any work of art. Um, but let's see. And we can use devices like, like we do in illustration, like semiotics, but also I like to introduce to that um, something that I picked up when I did my master's degree, um, translation theory, scopus theory. In other words, that bit that makes it quite important that you think where is this artwork going when you work with it? Who made it? When was it made? For whom was it made? The historical uh, background that's needed to read it. Um, some of you might know but that my students have all seen The Arrival by Sean Tan. And I think we could look at the physicality of the book on the outside. It looks like an old book, which it's not. It was published in 2006 in Australia. But can you see how they create that feeling of something archival, a journal almost? And then evidently the man in the picture He's wearing a hat, I would place him somewhere in the 30s, I think, uh, with regards to his costume and the suitcase. But right n in front of him, you see an animal that looks a bit like a science fiction creature, which is 
very typical of Sean Tan to mix, to hybridize uh, forms and also genres. We see that here, the arrival. It is about, and then we have the end papers. The end papers are not just wallpaper. What we have here is something that we often find when we talk about art and literature, the gaze. That is important because most of life um, is potentially political. And the subject of tonight is evidently also political. Where, uh, to whom are these people looking? Are they looking at us? Um, it seems as if Sean Tan started here with an array of faces, different uh, ethnicities. They all seem to me to be on the spot. They're looking at us, but almost as if they're gazing from the other side of the camera. Are we the camera? Are we observing them? Do we own them? Are they afraid of us? What are they looking at? What are they thinking? And then we have the title page, which also includes information that's, that's very interesting. When, look where, uh, when you look at the time when it was published, um, it was just prior to the, the current migrant crisis that we experienced in Europe. Um, but it's evidently a phenomenon that comes a long way, that have, has been around for, for quite a while. Yet again, let's look at the gaze. The main character, we could assume by now, is looking over his shoulder, is looking backwards, it seems. And being a migrant myself, I can associate with so many of the things that I see in these books. You always look back. <coughs> and then the, an interesting thing about this book that it's it's a hybrid form between the picture book and the graphic novel, something that's very contemporary that you often find in post-modern um, picture books and um, storytelling. There are no words in this book, uh, which yet again to me is quite significant, thinking that this is about the arrival. It's about migrants. Very often, um, another thing I see some of my colleagues here specialized in literature. We all know the, uh, the, the theme of the other in literature and in art, which is very uh, prominent when we talk about uh, migration and migrations. Um, so it's a voiceless book in a certain way. Uh, and then you see these objects th that refer to very ordinary life, not the lives of rich people, we see a cracked teapot, a teacup, and a suitcase, and a family photo. And then on the first double spread, family photo again, and just take notice of all the, the, the hands, that intimacy. So what's being created here is a feeling of, it's almost anticipation, but I get a, a feeling of, of, of real tenderness, and then being repeated there in the main image. The child wakes, and yet we're confronted with another gaze. She's, she's not looking at us. It's almost as if the, the characters are not aware of the reader, but she's obsessed with a suitcase. She knows what that means. They close and they go. And then on the right-hand side, for the first time, do we get a glimpse of, of what's going on. There's a bigger force here, which there always is when somebody, mig somebody migrates. And then we zoom out and we see the cityscape. Another thing that we always find in, in most of these books are the landscape, in this case a cityscape. That first environment that a child knew, uh, a sense of place, that becomes sort of the, the baseline for the, the understanding of the landscape or the cityscape of, of later life. And I found that in my own life here at Worcester um, I was ready to embrace a new continent, a new country, but I constantly looked back as well. I think I could not get rid of, I think, that blueprint of the country that I was born in. <coughs> and here we see the threats. Uh, so it's evidently like very often it is uh, with, with uh, refugees, there's a threat. It's almost symbolic. It can't be real. It's science fictional. What is it? All these tentacles. And there we see the family 
at the bottom. And then to a station, another iconic place in film and in literature for departure or arrival. Um, and at the back, can you see the, um, the, the, the tentacles? Are still they are still visible in the sky there. And then there are more scenes of intimacy of the family, yet more hands, and a train disappearing on the horizon. And then the, the mother and the daughter go back home um, into the city with his problems. I'm not going to show the whole book. Quite frustratingly, I, I have too many books to share with you, and I can't show them all fully. With picture books, it would have been ideal to, sh to, to show the whole thing, because it's, it's important also it works with, uh, with, with sequence. Um, it can't really be ignored. And ideally, one would have all the words with them to, to, to see that interplay between image and text. <coughs> so there we have him in his cabin, eating. And then yet again, the gaze. Where is he looking? And then in the middle, left, he's actually now, I think, looking at us and becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and he's just one of many. And the boat then on the horizon. And then another thing that I found in most of the books that I've chosen to share with you, books on migration, is the importance, I've said it already, the landscape, the setting. And it becomes ominous very often. In this case, uh, like we often have in literature, in children's literature, more specifically the, the, the forest as a dark place, the archetypal forest, but also the sea, um, very prominent in, in migrant stories, especially in, in Europe. And those clouds really have an ominous... Um, this is the very last picture from the book. A bit that I, that I should have perhaps in, included was also, that's another phenomenon, language and and you can hear me how I'm struggling tonight I'm speaking to you in my second language and it's it's not easy even though it's my second language and I've, I've, I've learned it in school since I was six uh, it's like giving birth um, with every word you're saying it's especially in um, I'm a bit relaxed now but it, this is a daunting a moment um, so in this book, there's also a moment where you see the man who left trying to communicate and making signs and expressing himself by drawing pictures. And all the signs seem alien in the city, in the alien city that he's, um, he's going to. It's actually a rather thick book, and I can not share the whole book with you. The very last image, so his wife and, and, and child joins him, and the last image is... His daughter then helping a new uh, person arriving in this uh, foreign city and show her, show her the way. Um, this book is one of the most powerful books that I've ever read. Um, it is also one of the few books um, that have been translated from, sadly, um, Okay, I also live in an Anglophone country. Uh, English is the, the um, national language in South Africa, official <coughs> language. Um, the Anglophone lang uh, countries do not have a good record of translating, sadly. I think something as low as 1% of the picture books that we show or we buy or we offer in the Anglophone countries is, is from elsewhere, from other countries and cultures. And that says a lot. Um, yeah, this book is called The Island, the Insel. Uh, what I forgot to say with the previous one, important information, that Sean Tan is an immigrant child. He was born in Thailand. He lives in Aus Australia now. Important information that I forgot. I remember that now because Armin Greer the same. He was born in Switzerland, but then moved to Australia early in his life, where he's now a lecturer and an illustrator. The island, and normally in picture books, we, we like to show a character on the, on, the, on the cover because that is a point of entry into the soul of the character. Um, but here not. We have a, f a fortress, a wall, the island. And on the end papers, yet again, very important end papers to the book, we just see the waves. And they are, uh, they are threatening, aren't they? They're just black. And they come, there's, there's more and more and more of them. And the sky is not a friendly sky either. And then we go to the, the title page. 
the insel, the, the island. And we see here, we, we are in the position of um, this newcomer. We are sitting on the, um, the raft. Can you see the raft in the front? So that's where we are being put, placed. And there we have it. Uh, the text there says, one morning the, um, the, 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 the inhabitants of the island found a man on the beach where he was, he, he landed there because of, of, of fate and of, of currents, and there he was. Um, and he stood up when, when he saw them, and he was different from them. And yet again, we are fixed by the gaze of this person looking at us. And what is our position that we are taking <coughs> when we're looking at them? And then we see the islanders. And he said, uh, yeah, they were not like him. They, they're much stronger, well-fed by the looks of it, and threatening. They have tools in their hand. And they asked him what he wanted. And yet again, language was an issue, of course. And they said, uh, that, and um, it's not a good thing for him to, to, to be away from his own people. Here he is. There's not much here for him to do. Uh, the fisherman, however, knew how rough it was in the ocean, and he, had, he was more sympathetic, the text says. Um, it was, he escaped death to, to be here. Uh, we, we, we have to take him in, he said. Okay, so then they take him in. That's how they take him in. And then they took him to the, 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 the stable where they, the pen rather, where the goats are being kept. Uh, that was for a long time empty now, at, at the end, edge of the island, and that's where they will where they keep him, where they will keep him. Uh, what is that? Oh, it's something appearing on here, but not on your screen. Okay, get rid of that quickly. Okay. And then, uh, as you can understand, you get more and more stories spreading and rumors. Uh, he should stay there. He could, of course, not stay with us. He could not eat with us. He's too different. And then also you see the, the nails and the hammer there at the top right. They put nails, they, they nail, they closed that door of the stable so they couldn't get out. And at the bottom you can see what the parents did. The kids got the message and the idea. And their lives go on. And then we have a very, I see Maureen here, you will recognize that as a nod towards uh, Edvard Munch's The Scream, a well-known painting, uh, Norwegian painting. Uh, it, the text said one day he was there in the village, this, this, this foreigner. And then Maureen, another one, the second one is from Fusli's uh, Nightmare, mm -hmm. a play on that. So he's, he gives his nod to Western civilization, Western depiction of horrors. And then the text there just say how people are talking about him, how he could not really eat with them. Um, here he was in their lives. They didn't really want him. And, and he was in their nightmares even, in their dreams. They did not want that. And then the schoolmaster said, he became rather um, expressive, as you could see, um, it's not good. And the, uh, the rumor even spread that he eats with his hands and he eats bones, things like that. And the, the parents started to, to scare the children with him. If you don't eat your food, he will come and get you. And the schoolmaster said that the children were afraid of him. How's that? And then the rumor spread that he is likely to come and kill us. And it even the, the newspapers mm -hmm. confirmed that. Why does all of this sound so familiar? And they decided, I'm skipping part of the book, um, obviously. They had, he had to go. They had to get rid of him, which they then did. They tied him. And look how powerful the, the use of the image is there, too. You don't see the, 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 the forks and the pitchforks. And the man, they shoved him right off the page. Into the waves. Off you go. On your float. And then what they did, they also burnt the boat of the fishermen. So make sure the fishermen wouldn't interfere in this decision. Also an image that I did not include. They even shot albatrosses down uh, in, in the sky not to have too many messages or reminders of, of this man. And then you have it. And then the very last image he was yet, this is the cover, but yet again we had the walls of this fortress. So uh, withdrawn to an island, contained in their island, happy they got rid of the migrant. 
um, very evident the, the theme of the other. A construction that is being created by people with power. And all of these stories have to do with power relations, don't they? Like, like most things in life have to do with that. Um, people with power are in the position to construct um, depictions of those who are different. And the cleverer you are, the, the more intense you make these construct the, this construction, like the islanders did there. And it, it's sadly just too, too, too familiar. At least here is a book um, to, that it seems slightly more cheerful, which it is, The Words of Eunice. Eunice. Um, um, this was by Nahit Kazemi. She's an um, Iranian illustrator now living in Canada. Yet again, another illustrator. And this story is mostly about <coughs> language failing her or her b inability to learn language. But we can so, so we, we open the book with her looking at the sign there, exit. Um, and then I'm skipping pages, as you might know. And the, the, the text tells us that her entire family did not come along. She's here in the new city, I think, with her uncle and her grandma and her auntie, but her mother not. And she's missing her auntie, uh, her mother, um, incredibly. Can you see how she's sitting in front of a window yet again? Uh, we find the migrant looking out, staring out at what? Yet again in school, the text says she's struggling with a word. She struggles to read and to, to concentrate. And yet again, she's gazing, she's staring um, out in the nothing. And at times, she remembers home. She comes from Africa where it's warm and vibrant. People are dancing and she's thinking of that. And here we have an image uh, where the illustrator illustrated text and loads of text and words because that is a struggle and uh, she's thinking constantly of a mother who is not there and constantly she's struggling to find words or to manage the words that she needs to communicate yet again she's looking outside of the window and then her mother comes one day she hears her mother's voice uh, bonjour 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 and that is her mother and then the story and one realizes the moment uh, when it's mentioned later that she, it, it's better now. She can manage the words, she, even this, 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 this foreign language, that she must have been depressed. So from the viewpoint of a migrant, a girl who went to Canada as a girl, uh, she remembered that and she could portray that for us. And then at the last page, which is an echo of the first double spread, yet again, our little main character in the far left, not too perplexed by the sign anymore. It, it's good again. So here we see yet again the, th the theme of the city, the cityscape, the landscape, the gaze, and the, the issue with language. The journey was, was, was created by an author illustrator, Francesca Sanna, yet again a migrant. Um, she she, was, she grew up in, in Italy and then she went to, to, uh, to Switzerland to study there and work there. And she worked in a refugee center in, in, in Italy and she collected the stories from the little children that she worked with and then created this book. And very often or, or sometimes uh, one tends to think that very stylized illustration like, like these are one thing could be less personal and sometimes uh, because it is a, it's a visual language very are frequently used in advertising and packaging like that, in picture book illustration it could create a little feeling of distance. Yet, with this one I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite moved by the illustrations because of the very um, particular way in which she did it. Here we have a family. I live with my family in a city close to the sea. Every summer we used to spend many weekends at the beach, but we never go there anymore because last year our li lives changed forever and the sea is ominously dark. But they're people like us. They go to the beach. They have holidays. The war began. Every day bad things started happening around us and soon there was nothing but chaos. So what used to be the sea becomes a monster and we see an interesting fusion between fantasy and, and fact here as well. But they flee the scene and look at the dark shadows there. And one day the war took my father. And we have just the black page 
and some remnants, only the father's glasses and little castles. Um, I'm skipping the scenes where they, they, they say goodbye to their, their friends and their pet, uh, their cat. Uh, we leave at night to avoid being seen and they change car on every other page. Interesting way the, um, the sequence is quite important. We just see one car off the other and it gets worse. The next move is they're being transported by somebody else, hiding amongst what looks to me like, like olive. Um, struggle to find English now. Big things. Jars. Jars. <laughs> Four letter word and I can't get it. And then after that, uh, a fruit, a vegetable van, and they're hiding in that. And then she's on a bicycle. And you see, and then they enter the forest. Yet again, the archetypal place where danger lurks. They arrive at the border. Can you see how small they are here on the, far, on the left? And on the far right, we see the wall. It is an enormous wall, and we must climb over it. And then they try, and there are guards to prohibit that, of course. They have to sleep the night in the forest. Uh, then the next morning, shouting wakes us up. It's a guard. Guards, they're looking for us and we must hide. And they hide and, and to the right you can see um, a good character, almost like a spirit in the dark. Somebody might help them. Is it just fantasy or is it a uh, port uh, um, portrayal of, of hope perhaps? Um, and then they're being helped over the wall and then they go on to a train uh, no, first they get to the, the sea, when we, we want uh, more back at the, to the sea. Then you see under the, under the waves a spurt, they think it could be, uh, what does it say, the, the um, dangerous monsters that hide beneath our boat, ready to gob gobble us up if the boat capsizes. And then we have another scene of the sea, and here the last double spread. They are migrating just like us. So, so whilst they're in the train, they look up and they see birds migrating. They are migrating just like us. And their journey is very long too, but they don't have to cross any borders. I hope one day, like these birds, we will find a new home. A home where we could be safe and begin our story again. And we see them on the neck of Flamingo there. But we have no idea how it's going to end. It's an open-ended story. Uh, a good way to, and a poignant way to, to end that. Because it's not certain when migrants and refugees start their journey whether they will succeed. A wonderful book, I actually thought I, br I, I brought it along and I forget to, to bring it here. I wanted to show it to you because it's a concertina book. You have to, it was a bit hard to, to get the images on, on, the, on the slide. Yet again, <coughs> by José Manuel Mateo, um, the author, the illustrator, Javier Martinez Pedro, Mexican. He is an illegal migrant in the <coughs> USA. Is, uh, they say that on the book. I'm sure Trump will, uh, will get him if he would ever read that. Um, yeah, the whole book, I, I'm, I can only show a bit. You have to read it, uh, you unfold it, not like a normal book, but you have to read it from top to bottom, which is a very interesting way. But with all these books, you see the importance of sequence. And here yet again, and also the format that he uses is quite um, typical of, um, of Latin America or, mi or Middle America. Um, it's called the Amate paper, which was made of, of a bark. Uh, that they used to that, and he actually did the, the artwork on that. The story is very simple. It's just telling the story of people who started out in this village there, and the village became emptier. It became harder and harder to make a living. You're not all migrants leave their countries because of political reasons or wars. Sometimes it's just uh, economical reasons as well. So they set on this journey by train. It's a long trek. Um, so I did not include more than that because it's, it's a bit too difficult to show. But in the end, they um, just want to get back to that. In the end, they end up in the city. So they move from the countryside 
to an utopia, many migrants think, and as we know, um, cities are not always utopians. The utopias, they're very often dystopian environments. So, but nevertheless, it's, it's quite a, a special book and also portrayed in the visual language that is very typical from middle America and with some um, nods to their original um, artworks. Here I am. Um, I love the title because it's of confirmation, Here I Am, uh, by the immigrant more, uh, boy. Story by the author Patty Kim, yet again a migrant um, from Thailand. I moved to America as a child. And Sonia Sandes, also a migrant illustrator. It is a story, yet again a wordless book. Um, for me, it says a lot, except for, for some references to, um, get rid of this thing, sorry, it's just in my way. Yet again, we are being shown the gaze of the boy, the boy by the window, like we've seen in so many of these books. Um, again, and the, can you see, and the bottom left there, it does not make sense, the word, the language does not make sense. There is no comprehension. And we follow the boy through different stages, we see him so often by a window, looking outside at, at, at what there is, the, the, the horns, everything is strange and nothing makes sense. The lettering on the shops do not make sense to him. And what the story tells us, uh, what you can see if you see more of it, and I have it here, he has a seed in his pocket, a red seed. Until now, we've had no uh, confirmation of where it comes from. But when he holds the seed in his hand, it changes and it becomes all magic. As you can see there, and he's been transferred back to where he comes from. And then we see it's, it's a, a place in the, in the east, in Southeast Asia. Uh, some, and, and then he's happy. That is his happy place to that seed that he brought along. And he puts it in his pocket. And then what happens is, okay, yeah, he still has it. When he goes to school, it makes things better. Yet again, blah, blah, blah. That is what he hears and sees at school, the language, the incomprehension there. And yet again, the boy in front of the window. Uh, what happens then, and towards the end of the book, is that he drops the seed. He's in front of the window and let it fall outside. He's quite upset because that was his saving grace to, to, to cling to that seed. And, but he notices that a little girl picks it up and he follows her. And that is actually a very good thing. Um, there's also for me some um, irony in the letter. At the end of the book, it's a wordless book, but the author, Patty Kim, wrote a letter to the reader at the end. And she said, what happens to us when we forget to be afraid? We loosen our firm grip on what belongs to us. We open our hands. We share. We give. So she's talking, Patty Kim, about the boy who dropped his seed because that led him to follow the girl into the city and he befriended the girl. But I just thought it should also be the other way around. She did not be. That should also, those words should not apply to the migrants only but to the inhabitants, to the, what happens to us when we forget to be afraid. We lose our firm grip on what belongs to us. We open our hands, we share, we give. It goes both ways. But I thought it was quite, quite um, brave of Patty Kim to say that on behalf of the migrants. Let us, uh, migrants, open our hearts and our hands and then we can embrace by doing so. <coughs> I'm moving now to my own work. Uh, I mentioned to you that I'm a migrant and my my poor English um, is, is, evident, is, is evidence of that. Um, the subject matter of my books have never been migration as such, but I think for me I've always been, because also, especially by my English publisher and my Dutch publisher, I am sort of the token African, which is a bit ironic. Here I am, a middle-aged white Afrikaans-speaking man, and I have to stand in to retell, rewrite African tales for European audiences. I'm sure you can, you can see the irony in all of that. And um, 
post-colonial commentary is, is very apt here. But so what happened here was uh, a book that I, I wrote and illustrated myself. Um, so I see my role, my stories are migrating. I, I retell or I illustrate African folk tales and they migrate. They travel to Europe and abroad and further afield and they're being shared with, with other people. Here my Dutch publisher told me a story briefly over lunch one day and he said this story is an Aboriginal Australian folk tale but I'd like you to retell it um, but an African version of it. So that is already problematic. We acknowledge that at least in the book itself because as we know with appropriation, yet again another theme that we are very aware of in, in the arts, the borrowing from cultures that are not ours, especially when we are in position of power. Um, it's easy to borrow, isn't it not? It does not belong to us, but we borrow. And I think that could be good and that could be right. Uh, but one should be respectful when doing that and acknowledging that it comes from a culture that is not one's own. So I, I did retell the story um, as good as I thought um, possible. I changed important bits of the story. Um, it's pretty much the story of uh, Tidalik, which is the giant frog in, in Australia, a country, a dry country like South Africa is as well. Um, and this frog star is, is, is thirsty and he drinks a little bit of water from the first the puddle in which he's sitting and the next one and then the brook and then the river and, and then the lake but he, he left the ocean because he did not like that. So and then in, in Australian version all the Australian animals say kangaroo and a kookaburra what not try to get, um, they all try to make him laugh to get him to open his mouth and spill the water. But I changed the story when I retold it, uh, an African, and here, listen to me, I'm saying African as if it's one little place. It's not. I'm guilty of that myself. Uh, this is a South African or Southern African version. One does not get African animals all across the continent. Um, they live like they do anywhere else in the world in specific places, but nevertheless, I changed it to the extent that I chose different animals and all of them behaved differently. They did not all try to make him laugh. They used rather menacing tactics to get the water out of the frog. So the lion said, I would claw him. And when he screams of pain, he will open his mouth and water will come out. It doesn't work because frog, though full of water, is still nimble and he escapes. Um, there was a, I, I introduced a crow and the crow says, I will curse him and, and slander him. And when he back chats, his mouth will, come, will open and the water will spill. Frog is just bored. He falls asleep. He doesn't want to hear all the talk. So it, doesn't it, doesn't it does not succeed. And then um, the, um, the chameleon says, I will entice him. I will um, tease him with a fly. I'll show him a fly. We both like flies. And when he opens his mouth to eat it, the water will come out. But the frog is so full of water, he does not want any food. So he ignores it. So in the end, I had the eels sisters, and they know Frog because they live with him. In the, they know how he works. So they tickle him, and then he laughs, and he spills the water, and it's all good again. So I introduced a mechanism of a, a different thing than the folktale I was told. So all of them used slightly menacing tactics to get it out, but in the end, it was the friendly manner that, that released the water. So what I did was... I went ahead, and this, is, this, these, this was my initial uh, illustration, and that one. Um, when you live in South Africa, you know, and th uh, this story could have originated in South Africa, which is a dry country, as Australia is. So, um, as we all know, stories of floods often originate in, in dry places. Um, for me, my country, though there are many green spots, is a brown country not a green country. So I chose a palette that is very dry. And then we have this expression when you would ever, you would travel from the north of the country to the south, which is a bit greener, near Cape Town, you would cross through the Karoo, which is a dry, arid, semi-desert, I would say two-thirds of the country is, is pretty much the Karoo. 
And we have the saying, it was so hot you could fry an egg on the bonnet of your car. Um, so I thought, I'll make the sun a fried egg, which I did then. And uh, my Dutch is fairly good. I was, I'm, uh, my, my grandfather was a Dutch immigrant uh, from Holland to South Africa. So my Dutch is my third language. It's fairly good. I think I know Dutch culture very well. I get along very well with my Dutch publisher. But I was foolish enough to think that this uh, metaphor would translate. It, it's, it's so place-specific. A sense of place is needed to, to understand that. And he said, I like your pictures, Pete, but um, um, it's awfully brown. The expectation is in, in, in Holland then when you, that when you tell a story about frogs, that they would be green. You can immediately see, uh, okay, I, I, I would admit to the, the fact that I was, I was a person in power borrowing a story from Aboriginal Australia being in charge, Africanize it or South Africanize it. But I was colonized by my Dutch colonizer. He pays the bills and that's how it works. So when he says the frogs are to brown, they are to brown. And then he said, and then your son, it looks awfully much like a fried egg. <laughs> I said, yes, that's the point. But how foolish of me, it cannot be a fried egg. Um, it never gets that hot in, in Holland or in England for that matter. So that was my frog. And that was what I changed it to then, so to, to green frogs. Um, then I'm just going briefly to show you a few images of, to recreate, it is so difficult to, because you have to, when you're an illustrator, you can't recreate an entire environment, can you? Sometimes you have to use iconic images. And it, in a certain sense, especially when I look back at it, it looks quite lame for me to, I mean, to a baobab and an acacia tree. That will do the trick. It will set the scene. And to a certain extent it does. And I think that's the way it works with semiotics, is not. You, you choose a symbol and it stands for so many other things. Um, but then also there's the personal element, and we all know that many of, uh, I see many of my colleagues here who are creators of one kind or another. Uh, one always hopes to put your own, to, to have your own signature evident and visible in your work. I think I'm drawn to, to humor. I'm often asked to do humorous stories, or the African ones then, being the white African, token African. Um, this book I did in a, a very long time ago. It was one of the first books that I've ever illustrated. And it's about a, a grandmother whose grandchild is born in, in Holland. And then she takes, she starts in Cape Town all the way to Holland. She gets onto a leopard from in Cape Town. There are some leopards in the mountain there. As Lynn would know, it's my friend Lynn, a uh, fellow South African, um, on the leopard. And then she goes through the Karoo on the back of an ostrich. And on the, in the savannah, she, she gets onto the back of a, a giraffe and so forth until she's in Casablanca, so right through Africa. And in Casablanca, she takes um, a wild goose. Um, and in Casablanca, I, 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 I included bits from the movie there in my illustration. But here, um, I mean, the dangers of this exercise are so evident that I thought, okay, one way to, to preempt, uh, to, to solve it is to preempt it, spill the beans. So I included here, obviously this is the, gay, what I portrayed here is the view, a white man's view of a journey through Africa. So I, I included the far back you can see Livingston. At least he was English, he's yours, it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there he is with his um, bearers, the guys, the slaves pretty much. And I, 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 I chose to, 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 to give this grandmother a guardian angel, and I turned her into, uh, I made a decided on a black angel. In the front, I included um, a freedom fighter, which is also part of the reality of South African history. And the granny, of course, and she changes costume as she goes through the landscape. And 
the, um, the ostrich, uh, it, it actually reflects a part of our history in South Africa, an era, a Victorian era, when ostrich feathers were very sought after and sold in Europe and it made millions, millionaires of many farmers in a certain part of the country, uh, part of the Karoo, the little Karoo. Elsewhere. So she's dressed in, in ostrich feathers. So it's a little play, a little tongue-in-the-cheek play with a, a little bit of post-colonial commentary then. And the meerkat then <laughs> is the gaze of the meerkat. He is, so I wanted to put him there to, to, to say, okay, what do you make of this? <laughs> um, other books that I've made, it's complex and I have been, when I made, they made this book, there was one journalist that's, that said she find the little girl ugly. Another journalist said, no, she's, she's cute. But it's almost as if you're, if you're a white man illustrating a, a, a black child, and if your visual language is very often humorous, cartoony, caricature, you cannot get it right. It does not matter what you do, you cannot get it right. And I've always been consistent, at least. My, my human characters are never very pretty. And I don't know whether I'm deep down uh, making fun of all people or do I hate all people, but I tend to give them large noses, sharp teeth, and things like that. Um, but at least all my characters, irrespective of their race, are comical. So I think it was a bit unfair. So you have the little girl, it's, it's a Red Riding Hood story, but it's Makulani and the crocodile. So it's a crocodile, a, a really beautiful story told by Maria Hendricks, different from the Red Riding Hood, but an African retelling. And yet again, my understanding of the landscape, the landscape can only be somebody's view of it. And you'll have to take my word, that is how I feel the landscape. It is brown, it is the savannah. I grew up on the Springbok <coughs> Flats, which is flat um, in the northern part of the country. Even books that were very European, this was a Dutch story uh, by, of course, Meinert Harry Jekers, The Ballad of Death, it was called. A brilliant story about death, but sort of the kind, um, it was a about uh, a king who was afraid of death and they captured death in a glass dome, tried to keep captain, and then life became unbearable because they couldn't stand the fact that they would live forever because they lived for ages. And then they released death and obviously the king is the first to go. Um, but it's also a beautiful story because it just shows that it, it would be unbearable if we lived forever. Nevertheless, um, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. So I, I approached the whole story. The first time out when I did it, it was rather grim. Um, charcoal, collage, and the Dutchman said, mm, I cannot sell this, which is part of the reality of making a book. If he can't sell it, it, it will not work. Um, illustration is an applied art. So this is how I portrayed the characters. And without really realizing until I finished it, it's most of them are African animals, uh, except there is a, 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 a stag there to the left, the one with the yellow pajamas, as you can see, which is not, not from my continent. Thank you. Okay, and then other books, <coughs> and I think hybridity, which is sort of a solution to this whole issue of the post-colonial issue that, that we have that the colonizers create a view of the other or the colonized, the people without power. Uh, a solution is to, to hybridize, and I think the term is being recognized as such in, in literary theory. Um, and I tend to think that I'm, I'm trying to do that. To it is tricky that you, you can imagine my grandfather was Dutch. I was born in Africa. I moved out of Africa and back. Um, I cannot get the place out of my system. Um, so where does that leave me? I'm not sure. A hybrid? Yes, I'll settle for that. So therefore, when I did this, the, the publisher was slightly wary of the fact this is a bit gruesome for English taste in picture books that the elephant would eat, though it, it happened in the story. 
but she wasn't sure about that, but she let me to do it in any case. So he's eating the elephant, but they get the better of him. So he eats loads of kids and then they make a fire inside him and they cut their way out of his, his tummy. I did not write the story, I mean, but I get it. There's another fellow South African dies also here. I think we understand the harshness of the continent. Uh, very often there's no beating about the bush. The, the realities are harsh. So I try to to, 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 to find uh, a middle way between the, rea the harsh reality and what is accepted um, in the code of, of, of storytelling in, on, on this continent. No, you're an island. We're an island. It's not a continent, is, is it? <laughs> Fiddle DD. This book is still to be published in 2019. Um, I'm just showing it because it's yet again my version here. I clothe them. I try to clothe them, um, dress them like old hippies, I think. <laughs> that was, uh, it's possibly where I would find myself soon. Um, uh, that one. So that is my latest book. Uh, then yet another thing that uh, you might have spotted. I think you had a similar incident here, and they had it in Sweden as well, where idiotic people in marketing and advertising um, portrayed a black kid wearing a monkey suit or something like that. Did, did you did you hear that story? Yes, it was here. And the same thing. Lo and behold, you cannot. Um, believe it, but more or less a month after y it happened here, the same thing happened in South Africa. You say, how could I be so stupid? But I think sometimes it happens without people being menacing. It's just um, insensitivity, perhaps. Here I was confronted with the same thing, because the monkey is the main character. And if you, if you have an African setting, and if you clothe them, you have to be careful. So that's why I went for a bit of a laid-back, cool, hippie um, outfits, though... So one solution that I did find was to include, in the end, on the very last page, also two children. There are no children, and ideally I would have liked to have kept the book like that, just having animals as the main characters. But the text ends um, something about, doesn't make your feet each, does it not make your feet each itch too? when you hear the monkey playing his fiddle. So I thought I'd introduce two children to clearly differentiate between not to, 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 to invite any misinterpretation um, of some children being monkeys or equalized to monkeys. I would never do a thing like that, but it, I understand the sensitivity, and I have to understand it. It is my job to understand it. So this is my solution, to, to show real children there alongside the animals. Then uh, something that's very dear to my heart is this project that is by a Maillard project by the International Center for the Picture Book in Society. And um, when Tobias and I initially started this center or founded it uh, with, with all the support that we could dream of from uh, the Vice Chancellor and our deans at the time, and later deans as well. One of our aims was one of the aims of the International Center of the Picture Book in Society is to engage <coughs> with society in its broadest terms by promoting multiculturalism, inclusivity of minorities, and socially disenfranchised people. That was one of the three aims that we set for ourselves with with this. And as a group, then. Um, by the time I left, we, we were a wonderful team. There were many of us. It was Andy who was also here, Andy Davies, and um, Stephen Fowler, and also Taz Lovejoy, our very celebrated um, technician, lead technician. We helped a lot with this. And then we also had Rebecca Palmer at the time. And in a group, we, we had this opportunity to, to do something. We asked for it, and we got it. Um, at the Biennale for Illustration in Bratislava, which is the biggest Biennale for published picture books in the world. It does not get any better to get a slot there in a gallery. So we grabbed the opportunity and we brainstormed. And I think, Andy, it could have been you who 
talked about birds, and we thought, why not birds migrate? So let's make birds. So we decided to invite illustrators from all over the world to illustrate as a bird. It could be a fantasy bird or a real bird. It's Peter Horacek there, a fellow of this university, he also, also sent us a bird. Um, and we got the spectacular f number of um, 350 birds, and it's still growing. It's still open until this Bologna Children's Book Fair in, in a week's time. Um, so we got from the most prominent illustrator, picture book illustrators in the world took part in this. I'm thinking of Esol. She was a winner of the um, Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award, same award that Sean Tan won. A massive uh, cash prize of 500,000 euros, not to be sniffed at. And uh, Roger Mello, who was a winner of the Hans Christian Andersen Award. No money, but loads of prestige. They call it the um, Little Nobel Prize. Um, people like that. And of course, all of our staff. We got cards from all over the world. We would still like more from certain countries. And, and, and there's also something in, in, in that, the statistics, if you look at who, who responded and how they responded, that is worth taking notice of and taking care of. I did my utmost to, to, to invite African illustrators. Interesting thing about African illustrators, um, I approached people in Ghana that I knew, also in, in Kenya, also in Botswana. And the strange thing, I'm in no position to, sp to, to, to speak because I migrated myself from Africa to Europe. Most illustrators move. They seem to be a species. I mean, with all these illustrators that I showed to you seem to be migrating. We seem to be a species that like to, to just fly off with the swallows and, and follow the summer. Uh, but we have too few from Africa. Um, we got some, they send them from France very often, especially Francophone African people go to, to France to, to work there in Paris. Um, that is, the photo that you see there is at Bibiana, the, the House of Culture, Art for Children in, in Bratislava. And this endeavor, the Bratislava Biennale, is being supported by UNESCO. So this is really a wonderful opportunity that we had to... Um, and one of our aims with this project was as follows. I'm going to read to you. Um, and this was sent to the people in the brief. We said, migration hopes, migrations hopes to draw attention. Migration is the title, hence the, the essay. To draw attention to the plight of thousands of children and their families who are, as a result of oppressive regimes, violence or poverty, forced to migrate to safer places in the world. Artists may not be able to change regimes, influence governments, or save the migrants, but they can raise awareness of a reality that has become part of the contemporary socio-political environment. As visual storytellers and as communicators, we can continue to pose questions and challenge indifference through our work, at the same time highlighting, highlighting the positive impact that the migration of peoples, cultures, and ideas has had across the globe. So, um, and it worked. We had, we had wonderful responses. So that's in the House of Culture. And I include a couple of images alongside that. We had two-dimensional images um, by all of our staff members. So that's one by Andy, one by myself there. And Tobias had a three-dimensional thing. He made a series of exploding clocks and all the um, a wonderful, all I can I point out that if every single bird he cut out of balsa wood with his two precious hands and, and colored it. it. It's a spectacular installation that was. It, it, it um, enjoyed a lot of attention. And then Stephen, uh, who is an international specialist, he is the man to ask about rubber stamping and I, I I'm not making it up. He wrote a seminal work on that, was published last year. And it will be the guide internationally on, on rubber stamping. And he gave a workshop there to um, the students from the university there at, in, in Bratislava, Slovak students. And there's some of the results there. The top there, Tobias and I went to Hayon Wai. And those few postca postcards there by Ella, there's one. And they, we, we had a handful, didn't we? 55 kids during this workshop made postcards for this project and we mailed them there and then on at Hayon Y all the way to, to Worcester. 
where Taz collected them and catalogued them. I include that to, to that man in the center is Dr. Dusan Roll. He's the founder of the Biennale for Illustration in, in Bratislava, which had its, it was 50 years old uh, the previous time. So there you have it, Becky Palmer, Stephen Fowler, Tobias, Dr. Roll, myself, I'm the pretty one in the hat, <laughs> and then Taz and, and Andrew at the opening function. And the same, this collection is migrating as any bird and any collection should. It's been to South Africa and it was quite eventful. They did not realize that, but the customs in South Africa provided us with a wonderful metaphor. It was frustrating and quite a bad experience, really. Because Taz carefully packaged it here, very carefully, too careful, I think, in a... Uh, a thing that other people carry weapons in, <laughs> an orange plastic container to, be, to ensure these, because they're precious. You can imagine 350 original artworks from the best illustrators from all over the world. So, and we had to add a value to that, which he did. At, uh, uh, the estimate was it's worth 20,000 pounds. That did not go well, down well in South Africa, the customs. So they, did, they don't let you know. So I, was, I, went, I drove down to, to Cape Town from Pretoria to hang this thing, which is a massive job. Here in Bratislava, I took all our staff to hang this thing. And there it was just me and my partner and my niece. Uh, we had to hang it. But it did not show up. Um, it was meant to go up on the f Wednesday. The, the, the fair started, the book fair started on the Friday. It did not go up because it was not released. And then a series of phone calls, several phone calls, angry phone calls, and later I gave it over to the organizers of this rather prominent book, book f uh, festival in South Africa. Um, and they were adamant, uh, postcards can't be this valuable. And then we explained how how come they are this valuable? And then they said, okay, it, in order to release such valuable artworks, even though it was not there for commercial purposes, even though it was there for educational purposes, you have to pay up, it's a massive sum in South Africa, it is 108,000 rands, which is 6,000 pounds, which is also a hefty sum. I mean, obviously the University of Worcester is not going to pay that. Um, the, word, the festival in South Africa was not prepared to pay that. Who? Why would we pay that? It's ridiculous. It should not be paid. And they said, no, you can claim it back. Nobody would take a chance like that, so we did not. And <laughs> so the, the organizer of the World Fair spoke in person to the, the customer and said, so we really need this. What shall we do to get it? They said, fill in the forms again, but do not say that it's worth 330,000 rand, in other words, 20,000 pounds. Say it's worth 25 pounds which they did, and within half an hour, <laughs> we had the postcards. So do I need a better metaphor than this dead brick wall? And these are just postcards. They're not human <coughs> beings. They're postcards that, that struggle to travel um, over the borders, struggle to fly. That is Roger Mello, Hans Christian Anderson laureate, looking at his own postcard. He was also there in South Africa to look, to look at it. This man, and he left without leaving us his name, and he did also not write his name on the back, so, but we, we are in the process of, of tracking him down. It's a beautiful story. In Bratislava, this man, I don't know whether you can recognize the photo there. We all, it's an iconic photo. It's set in New York, these construction workers. And this man came to us while, just after we put it up, and he said, can you put up mine as well. Here I made a postcard. And he said, the man on the right in that photograph is my grandfather. So he illustrated a little bird, a crude little bird, on that bar. And I thought, it does not get better than that. What a beautiful story. And then I, I'm overstaying my welcome now. Um, I'll just wrap it up by showing you a few of the postcards that we received. Andre Neves from Brazil. Interesting one, Axel Scheffler, the Gruffalo man whom we've had here at the university to speak, is uh, from Germany but also British. 
also interesting his postcard showing a customs office and the birds arriving. <laughs> it, is, it is a luxurious way of looking or thinking about migration, is it not? The, the office. To many people, it's not an office. There's no option of pleading your case in front of a human being. You get on a boat and you survive or not. Isol uh, from Argentina, that's an artist's name, is just Isol, Maricenta. Life is Movement, uh, she's a wonderful illustrator, one of the best and most uh, highest uh, accoladed illustrators in the world. Mara Thurnqvist, she's from Denmark, the Netherlands, she's an activist for migrants, uh, but also a picture book, uh, celebrated picture book um, illustrator. What did I leave? What will I find? My new home will be where new friends wait for me. So the, the illustrator had the option to, to share any message of their choice. It could be a message of hope. It could be a quote. And some of them quoted poems. Um, and in her case, since I know Marit a little bit, I think she's angry as well. That bird is, the red is quite poignant there. She's quite a, a feisty, she's an activist, but also a beautiful message there. My new home will be where new friends wait for me. Also interesting that Marit leads two lives. She lives between Denmark and, and the Netherlands. And then Sean Tan that I um, talked about already. He was gracious, so gracious to have given us two postcards, made originals. And I hope they will survive all the many um, journeys of this collection. I have not mentioned yet they want this in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, Brasilia, and Sao Paulo. But first, it's on its way now. Rehan has agreed to take it along in person this time. No customs, no DHL. Um, she happened to, to be visiting her father, so she agreed to take it along. It will be in, in Korea, in a place, um, yet again, it does not get any better than this. It's a Nami book island. Nami is... A, uh, one of two islands owned by really old Korean money, really rich Koreans. And these people, they are the sponsors currently of the Hans Christian Andersen Award because it's, a, it's an expensive endeavor, this, this massive competition. As I said, it's been named the, the mini Nobel. So these, this book family, on one island, for lack of a better word, they have created a theme park. It's a, called a book island. And you go there with a ferry, and it's just books and stories, workshops. I've not been there, but I'm very happy to say I have been invited to be on the NAMI Concour, their um, competition. I'll be on the jury, so I will be going and visiting NAMI in September. So th our collection of postcards is heading for NAMI Book Island, and to Seoul as well. It will go in a, in a gallery there. It does not get any better than this. And then, when we open the art house, um, I, I think we're not sure when yet, uh, it has to hang there. I think this collection has to hang in a, in, in a sp special place there. It, it deserves to do that. They want it in Japan as well. In Japan, they often make city tours, museum tours with these things. Um, they have an idea of five cities. To, that hasn't been confirmed yet, but they want it in Brazil, and NAMI is happening right now. Um, Muhammad Barangi. Um, what I find so beautiful about many of these is how people speak from the heart, from the gut. You can, you can see the cultural background, you can see the signature. Sometimes you can see the landscape uh, from which these people are making their art. He is evidently from Persia, from Iran. He says, my dream for everyone all around the world... There's a language issue here all around the globe is to have a legendary bird that can fly to wherever they wherever that they love to travel without fear having a good life is everyone's right so try to make these wishes become reality uh, Muhammad has just been uh, he's just moved to the UK um, he's a disabled um, athlete um, he has a, a distorted arm but he's, he's a sprinter but also an illustrator beautiful story I thought and so he's 
lives between Iran and here, but currently he's, he's living in the UK. Perhaps this, this comes, Sean Tan wrote a wonderful foreword that I would like to read for you, and I'll tell you about um, this foreword. Perhaps this is where a humble exhibition such as this, contributing to millions of other small and large humanitarian actions happening simultaneously around the world, can actually make a difference. By creating, looking, and asking questions, confronting despair, we invest back into an economy far greater than any stock exchange, more ennobling than any political system, and far less compromised. We sustain the world to imagine a better world for adults, and especially children, for whom the positive inspiration of art and story can never be overestimated. He wrote this, uh, we asked him to write a uh, foreword to our exhibition, the opening exhibition at Bratislava. And it will also be the foreword to a book. So Otterberry Books, the sponsor of Illustration Prize here at our university, they together in collaboration with um, Amnesty International will make a selection of 100 postcards and they will be published, I think, to buy, as they said, 2019 or the year after. It's a lengthy project and obviously this is the kind of thing that could sell um, to many countries. It's the kind of thing Amnesty have published previous uh, other books by, like this and they do extremely well. This is a wonderful opportunity yes, again, yet again for our project here from our center, our university, to travel and see the world. And the last image that I've that I'm showing you is in actual fact the first postcard that we received. It's by Stian Haller, a very <coughs> renowned Norwegian um, illustrator. He works digitally. But I think it's apt that I end with this because there's hope. There's a swallow and in its flight we see flowers and a rainbow, symbol of hope. Down below it's a grey ocean and it's a, it's a wide ocean, but there is hope. Um, yes, I, I would like to, to, to end there and to, to say thank you for this honor. And I'm very thankful that I could be part of a university that values things like this, this kind of project that we've been only receiving support from, uh, from all the lines of management above us. Thank you for that. Um, I'm honored and I'm proud to be um, involved here. And may our center go from strength to strength and, and have its celebrated place within the illustration course and the university. Thank you very much. just extraordinary. Um, I know that Pete's close colleagues and his students have heard him speak before. Um, there are some of us in the audience who haven't done so before and it was just a revelation. Um, I thought I knew how to look at pictures and I really didn't. Um, I think I feel I've never really looked and seen properly and um, I <coughs> feel I take that away tonight myself, and I, I guess I'm not alone, but there will be others who also see and have a way of seeing differently now. Um, what you've shown us about illustration is not saccharine or sweet. Um, it's powerful, it's emotional, it's angry. Um, you've deconstructed things for us. You've shown us how to really gaze in and look at the gaze coming back out of the picture. Um, you've taught us, I think, to look um, at the, what the pictures tell us about the individuals, their situation and the world they inhabit, and how that reflects back to us and challenges us to think about the world that, that we're inhabiting, because it's actually the same one. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a huge privilege to hear that. 
um, I feel that um, it's something that will live in all of our memories and there will, all of us will have taken a different image, a different moment of what you've been talking <coughs> about and, and it will stay with us always. So you are an amazing communicator as well as an amazing yeah. illustrator and a wonderful teacher. And if that's what being a professor is about, then maybe we should all try to be like that. Okay, so thank you very much.